sure I'm fairly happy with how my last video turned out. Uh, and I'd really like to do more of that sort of critical, observational kind of breakdown of stuff, if that makes sense. Like, I've got more ideas for that sort of thing down the line. Um, but I was thinking about that, and I kind of realised that I don't really want my videos to be all about tearing stuff down, in a way. Uh, like, that's not what my intention was with that video, but it was... My intention was to learn from the mistakes that the game made. Um, so in the spirit of fairness, I'm making this video as a way of saying, you know, you can do the same thing to me, or at least I don't mind if the same thing is done to me. So this video will serve two purposes. Number one, as a portfolio of some of my artwork. And number two, as a showcase of a project I've been working on, including artwork ideas, concepts, etc. Stuff like that. Uh, and with that being said, let's get on with it. Who are the moth folk? So, like, long ago, I decided I want to try my hand at darker and creepier themes in my artwork, and general art ideas, but I didn't want it to be all disjointed, if that makes sense. Like, oh, let's do a skull, and then, oh, let's do a zombie, and stuff like that, you know, it'd be kind of, yeah, disjointed, as I said. I wanted the work to be kind of connected in a way, and make it mean something, maybe via a story, or characters, or an animal, or, or an idea, even, you know. I decided to start drawing moths because they gave me a good excuse to practice shading and lighting compositions, uh, since they're attracted to light and people find them scary, so they make a good excuse to make them into like a horror uh, kind of piece. Obviously I know like the Mothman already exists and so do moth folk in, in some way or another, so it's not like I'm the first person to do this, uh, but these drawings also allowed me to sort of expand on their biology and their mythos, and that's kind of what I managed to do over time with these drawings. The moth folk stand slightly shorter than the average human, but are considerably lightweight for their height and build. They have a humanoid upright stature with arms, legs, and a set of lesser arms on its chest. Their arms and legs share the unique feature of them basically being an extension of their skeleton in a way. Would it make sense to say it's kind of like a mix between an exoskeleton and an endoskeleton? Like, I'm not a biologist or anything, so I guess I wouldn't know. So basically, their arms and legs are comprised of, like, hard bone. The claw-like arm appendages are designed for climbing and, like, clasping onto things, complemented by their lesser arms, light body, and upper body strength. Their body is covered head to knee in spiny quills, thinning around their faces. Uh, their wings are structured similar to a bat, however, are generally more rigid. Uh, they'd have a leathery feel to them, I think, covered in like a thin, sort of fuzzy fur. They have a pair of mandibles featuring sharp teeth and a, a proboscis for drinking liquids and producing silk by glands in their necks. They have two pairs of eyes, the forward-facing compound eyes and the ocelli at the sides. These forward-facing eyes allow the moth folk to see light and colours, whereas where they struggle to process motion. The ocelli allow them to process motion, give them an interesting field of view as you can see by this very shite diagram. They also possess a pair of antennae on the top of their heads, but that will be discussed more later. As mentioned, the moth folk have the ability to fly thanks to the lightweight bodies and powerful muscles powering their wings. By way of organs, the moth folk is kind of simple. They possess no heart, no conventional lungs, stomach, liver, and so on, really. They have a simple set of intestines due to their simple diet of liquids and salts. For a respiratory system, their backs are lined with millions of tiny pores, each connected to one of between 40 to 60 penny-sized muscles that diffuse oxygen into blood through their arteries. Carbon dioxide is then carried back and breathed out like us. I guess in simple terms, they have tens of tiny lungs slash hearts within the bones and muscles of their backs. This style of breathing grants them near unlimited stamina, but due to their breathing completely automatic, they cannot be submerged underwater, and are very susceptible to toxic gases. Their minds are tiny and can be barely considered more than an entanglement of sensory nerves and muscles. Regarding their reproductive cycle, they reproduce asexually via an unknown process. This makes them all hermaphroditic. Uh, this process begins at moth folk's birth, as the individual grows into a fully grown moth folk over a period of 10 years, and at around 5 years old they begin gestating a larva. Taking an extraordinary long 5 years to develop, the larva eventually metamorphoses into a miniature moth folk inside their chests, which the chest is no longer large enough to hold. The moth folk breaks out, and the cycle starts again, with this one growing over a period of 10 years. 
They are nocturnal creatures solely because the sensitivity of their eyes would blind and distract them. In fact, this problem plagues them during the night too. They seem to have a paralyzing obsession with light and where it comes from, going to suicidal extremes to find it. Their eyes are so sensitive to it that if a single mass was lit for 10 seconds in 20 acres of densely packed forest, a moth folk would have little trouble in finding its source. They are so determined to find the source of a light that they frequently burn themselves, maim themselves, or blind themselves in its pursuit, sometimes even stumbling into bodies of water and drowning. As for habitat, they can be found anywhere that is in a forest or even a cave. This is to minimize exposure to sunlight, moonlight, and stars before they find somewhere to sleep. They tend to live in small colonies of between 10 to 20 individuals and stay usually in one given location unless guided elsewhere in pursuit of the fabled light. However, it is easy for them to wander from the colony and find themselves alone and lost. Other times, the entire colony can be dragged to human settlements and, well, not very good, is it? In terms of intelligence, they aren't very intelligence They show very little in the way of problem-solving skills, opinions, or any kind of complex emotion. They are driven by the instinct to drink and sleep. The moth folk have an interesting stake in the claim of endurance and combat prowess. On one hand, their diet gives their blood antiseptic properties, and their highly sensitive eyesight helps them invade predators like bears, wolves, etc. Plus, their sharp arms and claws help with... Uh, piercing skin I suppose. But on the other hand you can only fight back so much with half a brain and when you're lighter than most predators. And while they do travel in large-ish packs it is purely for ease of finding fruits and water. They rarely communicate with their pack other than to retreat or to follow. However they do act very unusual sometimes. Sometimes they act in ways that don't correlate with their interests. Acting outwardly aggressive, showing little interest in light, going weeks, even months without sleep being out in the day. This behaviour can even get to the extreme of moth folk harming themselves and other members of the colony. So why is this? There is a 1 in 900,000 chance that a moth folk can be born with their male chromosome suppressed, and an entirely female creature can be born. The female goddess shares its smaller underlings biology and frame, four arms, two legs, upright walk, wings, etc, but are much much larger, actually dwarfing them. As well as this difference, the goddess does not give birth in the same way as the smaller ones. She also features four forward facing eyes and a much stronger set of mandibles and a jaw, and a pair of large antlers on her head in place of the traditional antennae. The goddess grows at a much faster and thus more painful rate in comparison to the moth folk, taking just 5 years to fully grow compared to 10 years. Their minds also completely differ to their miniature brethren, but we'll talk about that later. And finally, they are much, much more vibrant in colour scheme, coming in seemingly an unlimited amount of patterns from the Lepidoptera order. The intelligence of a goddess deserves its own segment because it could be seen as the most drastic difference she has between the moth folk. The underlings could be easily described as animalistic, purely motivated by thirst and whatever else. However, the goddess is much more human in a way. Her brain is much more developed and complicated, or at least has the capacity to be more complicated. She has an inner dialogue, reasoning, problem solving skills, long term memory, and so on and so forth. But a complex brain demands careful and complex nurturing, which is sadly not what she often gets. Picture throwing a baby into the forest, well like not literally like Yeet! but like they're going to be deprived of any kind of like development or education or love and obviously it wouldn't last very long. Now give that baby all the tools it needs to survive and then all the tools it needs to sort of kill. That's what you're dealing with. If by way of miracle that she doesn't suffer an awful upbringing, the goddess's mind would have the ability to compartmentalise thoughts into two places effectively, granting her the ability to solve two problems at the same time. She could learn at amazingly quick speeds, memorise complex sequences for years at a time, and that is likely the tip of the iceberg for the potential power of her mind. But on the other side of the spectrum, all that power gets wasted on brutality and savagery. She also has more comprehensible powers like the strength that comes with her size, the reaction times her eyes give her, 
flight, and last and most important, the power of control. The Mothfolk's antennae seem completely useless out of context, used to track and pick up pheromones that don't even exist, because that's what they were used in the insect world. However, a goddess changes that. The antlers on her head give her the ability to attract swathes of mothfolk from miles upon miles away via pheromones as mentioned. This is surprising since mothfolk normally do not mix with members of another colony, so the goddess has the power to combine colonies into what is called a nest. Named such because of the rate the mothfolk develops silk exponentially increases, developing more homes, or hives I guess you could call them, and places to stay. The control goes beyond attraction however. With her horns, the goddess has the ability to command orders to her underlings. Forage, build, search, destroy, fight, you see how it is. That is why it's imperative to the moth thing that the goddess isn't a complete fucking moron psychopath. It seems like she has the ability to not only control their actions, but influence their state of mind. Perhaps making them all panicked and terrified would make them produce or expand a nest faster, or making them ignore pain and fear would get them to drive out humans from a location more effectively. Not only that, but this influence and control demands an allegiance, an undying loyalty. Now obviously this wouldn't be doable with a mind as simple as the smaller moth folks, but under the influence of her it seems like the underlings start to change. During the five years it takes for the goddess to fully develop, her mere presence begins a sort of transformation within the nest. Their minds begin to grow and change, becoming more than just an entanglement of sensory nerves, now becoming a fully fleshed, even if small, brain. They begin acting more curious, and emotions they convey through body language become more frequent and more intense too. They develop problem solving skills, primitive opinions, and can even be seen communicating with other members of the nest, speaking with an entirely new and unique body language and gestures. A, a language that no other nest possesses too. They become more individual, only to become more obedient. Along with this mental development, the moth folk also undergo drastic and painful changes to their anatomy. They undergo a state of sequential hermaphroditism, transforming from both genders simultaneously to being just male. Sounds an awful lot like a Twitter bio. Anyway, they entirely lose their productive organs, which get absorbed into the body. They even grow a pair of primitive tri-digit hands, featuring two thumbs and one finger, allowing them to handle materials and generally climb and manoeuvre much more accurately. Not only do the now male moth folk change, but the goddess begins to gestate and lay clutches of between 400 and 500 eggs, at a rate of every five years, which are taken by the males and inseminated, allowing a much less taxing reproductive cycle, granting the males a longer lifespan. But even then the effects of the control don't end, because they seem to have a sort of zoonotic effect on our minds, manifesting as anxiety attacks, outbursts of intense paranoia, nausea, and hallucinations of strange, murky figures that aren't actually there. The bleak future is the most likely of end stages for the Mothfolk collection, since it demands a failure of the goddess's mental department. Her childhood consists of fear, terror, pain, and so on. This could be due to predatory animals or harsh climate, uh, disease in her colony members, and so on. This results in an unhinged, developmentally stunted goddess who may not even realise she has the ability to control the underlings. In that instance, the nest will disperse out of fear for this huge monster thing that keeps following them and killing their members. Or maybe it would be too late by the time she discovers her powers and uses them to torment and hurt the underlings. A slightly smarter goddess might be invested in live autopsies by a willing subject, to see and understand how their anatomy works, or maybe she'd want to conduct experiments on them. And lastly, the absolute smartest a goddess could be in this sort of stage would be just barely understanding her role as leader, but neglecting the need to scour for resources or build a hive, or maybe even flat out rejecting the position of leader. Now the prosperous future is simply one where, one, the goddess' upbringing is peaceful, or at least reasonably peaceful. And two, she understands her role as leader and the long-term implications of her presence amongst the moth folk. She gradually sees and understands the evolutionary changes taking place, and thus understands that the survival of those under her is paramount to the survival of the collection as much as she is. This could result in a relentless advance for territory and land and colony members, or a very reclusive and safe strategy, or even a strategy involving us. 
the only way a goddess could be even smarter than this, possibly, is if they grew up around human structures and saw and observed our accomplishments and behaviours. She could go full commie on us and try to infiltrate our settlements and go full subversion style on us. See, while her control abilities only make us fear her, a smart fucking chair squeak, a smart goddess could make the right people fear her just slightly enough. With the influential and powerful under her thumb, they surely couldn't speak ill of her. What are the consequences? And then people pick a side. Those who side against the collection can be taken care of easily. And those that side with the important become useful in normalising the collection. From town to town the collection grows, and with the knowledge that we give her, the goddess plans her moves carefully. Who does she see that will resist? Who has the biggest reach? Who can we convince to condemn those who resist? Bit by bit they take over our land, our territory, our ideas, and with people convincing others that they are merely misunderstood, well, I mean, who can stop them? Meanwhile, new mothfolk young are born with the genetics of the goddess as well as the mothfolk, making the next generation a smarter and stronger one. The goddess learns our necessary technologies right under our noses, and they build off of our structures, all with our permission. From there, I guess it's up to the collection what happens. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs> I have no idea if this is going to be cringe or boring or whatever. I literally have no idea. So um, any thoughts and all that, you know, what you think. Maybe it wasn't very good, whatever. Anything along those lines would be greatly appreciated because, you know, it's all, you know, I have been doing this for very long. But, um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Uh, also, I guess you could say along the way making the video I had a couple of calamities like uh, I won't go too much into detail, but I'll say this way, I'm glad I saved a backup, because, uh, you know, it went all tits up at one point. So, because of that, there wasn't, there was a lot of stuff I couldn't put in this video that I wanted to do. So that does leave me with a lot of ideas I could use for, like, a part two, if that, if anyone was interested. Uh, I have a lot of, yeah, things that could go in it, like, uh, the last bit where I was discussing about, you know, the the whole indoctrination thing and the takeover of, <laughs> of mankind. There's a lot more to that than I actually said, so I would like to go into that more... <laughs> fucking chair, man. There's a lot more to that that I'd like to go into more thoroughly, um, but that would mean making another video. I'm not doing it for this one, because this one's been waiting way too long, so... Anyway, I might, there could be a part two in the future, but uh, again, I'd also need more art, and uh, uh, not all of these pieces I made for this video are made for the video. They were made like years ago or, or months ago, but oh, there's only like a handful that were actually made specifically for the video, but obviously for a new video I need to make a lot more, so. But that's just putting that out there. Um, also I had help making this video with commissions and an intro, so all the links to the people that helped me out will be in the description, and I recommend you do go check them out because they do basically what I do, but a million times better. So, yeah, so go check them out. Uh, anyway, I've got a couple things lined up. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you with whatever the fuck I do next. It could be anything at this point.